and thank you for the invitation to come and talk at tonight's 128th HG anniversary dinner. This is great. Um, and I am indeed honoured by the invitation. Although, um, on reflection, perhaps it's not that great an honour, uh, since there are so few university economists with any interest at all in the ideas of Henry George. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't diminish the honour in any way, but it does mean that there's that, not that many speakers to choose from if you're uh, casting around among university economists who've got some sympathies on this subject. Yes, I am a Georgist, but as I'm going to argue a little later, I'm also a Keynesian, a Marxist, an institutional economist, uh, an advocate of green economics, indeed drawing, some would say rather eclectically, from a whole array of contributions within the tradition of political economic thought. Uh, like most of you, I... I um, I'm very disappointed at the marginalisation of Georgist ideas within discussions of, of economics and political economy and have done my modest uh, to try to redress that imbalance. But I think Georgism has probably got a lot to gain from engagement with other currents of economic thought uh, and uh, the selective blending of elements uh, of the sort that I've just described. And I've certainly tried to do that in my own teaching, teaching students about the diverse ways in which we can understand capitalism and its development, uh, trying to research the ways in which we can draw tools from different elements in, in the history of economic thought, update them, apply them to the challenges that we face today. So the remarks I want to make to you are partly about the history of economic thought, but they're also partly about the relevance of Georgist ideas and other currents in political economy to the major challenges that face us in the world around us, in particular challenges of economic security, social inequality and ecological unsustainability. But as a preamble to that, I, I think I want to reflect a little bit upon the nature of knowledge itself um, and how it's used or misused in, in uh, public arenas. Out there in the real world, there's a whole lot of stuff going on all the time. Individuals engaged in a whole array of economic activities, earning a living, managing an income, trying to look for investment opportunities, etc., etc., etc. Finding some shape and some pattern in what's going on out there is the analytical task we face as political economists or more generally as social scientists, trying to understand the world so that we may reshape it for the better, or at least make some modest contribution to that process. But then there's a third sphere beyond the reality out there and the analysis developed by uh, intellectuals, and that's the sphere of understanding. And all of us, I think, grapple with that. There's vast amounts of information, vast amounts of arguments about what is and what could and should be. Uh, what goes into our heads and what do we act on? And in particular, what do policy makers act on from among that buzzing array of information that they deem useful and appropriate for their purposes? That third realm is a realm of what you might call social psychology. It's uh, to do, to, for example, with personal experience that makes some ideas resonate more strongly than others. And I think back, to, for example, to my own personal experience growing up in the UK in an area that was then uh, quite a rural area. It, it's since been swamped by urban expansion, suburbanisation of a, of a nearby big town. But when I was growing up, I, as a kid, used to love wandering around the fields. 
I came to know that most of those fields were owned by a landowner. Uh, a hangover, so to speak, from a medieval England uh, with a big country house, a massive estate, and... Uh, but that, none of that worried me because uh, I would freely roam the area, climb over fences where necessary, scrump the apples out of the orchard uh, because surely there were many more apples than any uh, single household could possibly consume and so I didn't feel uh, that it was uh, outright theft to get uh, a little for free. <laughs> Some years later, I went back as, as an adult to revisit some of my childhood haunts, and I went wandering around the, uh, the estate, just like I used to, and some guy came up to me. I, he might have been a gamekeeper or something like that, and uh, he had a gun. And uh, I mean, guns aren't very common in the UK, although people do use them for hunting. And, uh, I was a bit apprehensive, and because he, he yelled out uh, across the field to me, uh, "Where have you come from, and where are you going?" <laughs> and uh, I yelled, I'm, "I'm just going for a walk. Just going for a walk." And he said, "Well, go back to where you came from." <laughs> uh, and, and I did. <laughs> uh, but I, it was a moment for me when I really thought the question of private ownership of land and the exclusive use of land really resonated. And I remember it to this day as, as almost like a life-changing experience, uh, comparable to the first time I got sacked as a worker for doing what I thought was a good job, uh, but bending the rules in order to get the job done in a way that explicitly flaunted the directions of the head waiter. Uh, I thought I was pretty good, pretty smart, pretty nimble, uh, but he uh, thought otherwise. I swore at him and that was the end of my career in the, uh, in the restaurant industry. <laughs> Life-changing experiences which cause you to think some things are important and other things aren't. And I, I, I say this with some hesitation because I've made my career as a university academic on the presumption that knowledge is something we acquire to be useful, to be applied wherever it can make a contribution to human advancement. But I observe, uh, not just particularly among students, but more generally among the general public, that some knowledge is acceptable and others isn't. Indeed, uh, think about knowledge of climate change. People are sometimes sceptical, that's fine, but uh, deeply resistant to accepting the evidence, the arguments, uh, the analysis. And so you think, well, what is, it, what is this barrier that is so obstructing uh, progress in, in an area such as this? I think uh, these reflections, though they're a preamble to my remarks, are, are particularly pertinent to Georges, who I think have a lot of good analysis to offer, yet feel recurrently frustrated by the lack of interest, and let alone action, on, on the knowledge uh, and arguments that, that are being presented by Georges. Well, I think to some extent that can, the source of that can be found by looking at, at the history of economic ideas. Mainstream economic thinking is very influential. It has its roots in neoclassical theory developed uh, more than a century ago, uh, which has waxed and waned in its uh, acceptability, but on the whole has remained a dominant orthodoxy um, through periods of boom, periods of uh, recession, uh, through periodic economic crises, uh, through periods in which incomes have become more unequal or, or less unequal, waxing and waning. But orthodox economics seems to go on forever as a set of timeless principles based on theories of demand and supply, individuals seeking to maximise utility, uh, 
interacting in markets that create efficient outcomes as long as they're reasonably competitive and that that results in the resolution of conflict through uh, the establishment of prices at which mutually advantageous exchanges can occur and where uh, exchanges expanded internationally into international trade so too there are gains from trade that may not be altogether equally shared but which benefit all in the sense of uh, paving the way for further economic growth and prosperity that that's the standard orthodoxy that is taught in most universities to most university students who enroll in in the, that course but it's always been a very selective story uh, situated in the context of he economic thought. Some say it has its roots in uh, Adam Smith's uh, early writings, but uh, that's a little doubtful. I mean, Smith certainly took the view that it was self-interest that motivates most human behaviour a reasonable enough assumption. Who was it who famously said, if there's two horses running in a race, one called self-interest self and the other altruism, put your money on self-interest, because you know it's always trying. Um, Paul Keaty, thank you for that. Uh, uh, but, 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 but Smith saw the, um, the drivers of economic growth more fundamentally in the division of labor, the expansion of trade. Uh, and he, he was not blind to the dangers of over-reliance on markets. He famously warned against the tendency of capitalists to conspire. He was, so Smith could be said to be in favour of markets where they're competitive, but very distrustful of capitalists because their self-interest would likely to lead to the development of monopoly that would work against a, a broader public interest. So a capitalist economy that was only then emerging at the time Smith was writing could indeed be a driver of increase in the wealth of nations, but it needed to be... Uh, watched at every step of the way, shepherded through the processes by an enlightened state, or sovereign, as, as uh, Smith wrote in his own time. The importance of the ethical dimension was very prominent in Smith's thinking. He was, after all, a professor of moral philosophy. And then David Ricardo, uh, himself a landowner, uh, British uh, parliamentarian who made major contributions to understanding of land, layering in the land dimension to Smith's analysis and showing how land can generate an economic surplus. That, I think, was a major contribution that paved the way, albeit for a very different interpretation of the economic surplus, by Karl Marx. Marx, I think, can be situated in terms of this tradition of classical political economy as someone who took the notion of an economic surplus arising from land, as in Ricardo's thought, and applied it more generally to the exploitation of labour. In other words, seeing the economic surplus arising because of the domination of capital over both land and labour. Now, of course, significantly, that switches the attention from uh, the capacity of the landowning class to extract and appropriate a surplus to the role of the capitalist class, then emerging and developing uh, a a as the principal beneficiary of that surplus extraction process. These, these were, in their own time, very unsettling ideas. I mean, Ricardo, the landowner, talking about the... Let's not mince words, the parasitic role of, of a landowning class in capitalist development. And Marx, of course, arguing that the whole system is itself based upon the exploitation of land, and as some Marxists would also add, the exploitation of nature in a way that is uh, 
tending recurrently to generate economic crises and perhaps long-term breakdown. Marx was right, of course, before we knew anything about the long-term consequences of the abuse of the physical environment. But uh, I think one can see in that analysis some forerunners of modern concerns uh, about uh, ecological catastrophe. So it's not just the exploitation of labor, but also the uh, relationship of capitalist development to land that comes strongly into the picture. But there were other writers at that time, uh, uh, less scholarly and academic, but picking up on notions of natural justice, writing pamphlets that were circulating in Britain, or the United States and continental Europe, about the need for equality in the access and fruits of the land. Uh, natural rights became a very important uh, current of thought. And to some extent, I think the great uh, classical political economist John Stuart Mill was picking up on these concerns and trying to show how capitalist economics could be blended with the quest for a good society in which principles of social justice prevail. To cut a long story short, in Mill you see the arguments that the, the capitalist development depends upon certain economic principles which must be obeyed, but that uh, the distribution of the fruits of that increasingly productive economy is a political choice, a political choice. So, in other words, let the economy generate the wealth and let the political system decide how the fruits of that wealth will be shared. And I think that, to this day, remains a resonant argument, uh, which you might see among sort of uh, some uh, people centre-left of politics who want to harness sort of free market economics to principles of social justice. It's always a, an uneasy relationship. But arguably, that's what Henry George took on as a challenge. And I, I think one can argue, and I'm sure the argument would be well accepted in this context, <laughs> uh, that, that, that he did it better than, than Mill, because he more fundamentally identified the role of land in, in that surplus generation process and the need to redress that, because without that correction, nothing else could be done that would be uh, of, of enduring effectiveness in creating a socially just outcome. We celebrate the uh, visit that uh, Henry George made to Australia in uh, 1980. Was it 1980? 1890. 1890. 1890. Sorry, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a decade out. Yeah, progress in poverty, 1779. Uh, Eleven years later, down under, having visited uh, the UK in in the meanwhile. And uh, I think it's important to remember the context in which this was all done uh, uh, during a period. Uh, the scene the industrial revolution, social upheaval, intellectual concerns about how the fruits of the, this economic transformation were going to be sustained and shared. And George's ideas had a lot of traction, of course, in any frontier society. They were developed in his own context of the United States, uh, uh, trying to explain how the fruits of westward expansion across the, the, this uh, country that's stolen effectively, violently, from the indigenous peoples came to be concentrated in the hands of uh, landowners who then uh, got rich while leaving others in, in poverty. That's a very short version of, <laughs> of, of the George's story. Uh, but uh, the ideas, I, I, I truncate them in that way, just to illustrate how it had a natural resonance for settler societies, frontier societies, where uh, social injustice was very much associated with the appropriation of uh, 
of land uh, as uh, European uh, colonization and settlement uh, impacted on that nation. I understand that from reading Robert Pullen's book that uh, George uh, received rapturous response, albeit not without some criticism during his tour of this country. Um, he uh, was here for 98 days, went to 34 Australian cities and towns, as far north as Rockhampton, where he went by ship from Brisbane. So he had a mixture of modes of transport while he was here. Uh, he spoke to packed audiences pretty well everywhere I, he, he went, and uh, Pullen's research suggests that, uh, according to newspaper reports, Bear in mind there were no recordings that uh, we know of about the content of his speech, but extensive newspaper reports of what he said, and uh, all, generally the tone of those reports was to uh, draw attention to his strong arguments, his ethical social concerns that often inspired, and I quote, a semi-religious fervour among his audiences. Uh, George expressed, uh, among other things, uh, perhaps rather surprising affinity for trade unions. Um, of course, he was opposed to monopoly, but um, obviously he had some sympathy for the need for labour to band together to pursue uh, its, its interests collectively. Reading John Pullen's book, I have a copy in my bag here, which I, I think, I, and I recommend it strongly to any of you here, uh, is interesting for all sorts of reasons. It transports us back to an era when public meetings were the mainstay of political activity and workers' education. Uh, its attention to historical detail conveys a strong feeling for the events atmosphere and concerns of that time. Uh, and, and one gets a picture of George himself as uh, warm, witty and wise, which isn't a bad trilogy. The book ends, I have to say, with a, a separate section. Y you've, you've read this, Geoffrey, I presume, uh, which is uh, about the relevance of these ideas today. I think it's extremely well written because it doesn't duck any of the challenges. The challenges, for example, about the increased number of people who see themselves as having a stake in the fruits of private land ownership and are resistant to anything that uh, can be interpreted as a tax on the family home. I mean, we're all well aware of, th of that political obstacle and, and the uh, political fallout that comes from the mention of extended land taxation, let alone propositions about the single tax itself. So uh, I repeat, I, I recommend it to you strongly. But, uh, of course, the story doesn't end there. Uh, George's ideas, powerful and well-received as they were in many uh, parts of society, were uh, totally um, unacceptable to prevailing economic interest, landowners most generally, but significantly also the mainstream economists. Uh, uh, Gaff Mason Gaffney and uh, Harrison recount the, uh, the backlash against Georgism. Uh, prominent American economists like J.B. Clark wrote explicitly about the need to counter these dangerous doctrines. And they must have been perceived as very dangerous in their time because arguably the marginalization of George was e even more vigorous than the marginalization of the dangerous doctrines of Karl Marx. So it's kind of insightful, I think, about how powerful were the interests of private land ownership at that time that uh, 
uh, that they actually had the economics profession on side uh, in, in their attempt to marginalise these dangerous doctrines. But then the 20th century rolls on, Great Depressions happen, John Maynard Keynes' his ideas come to the fore, and I think very usefully too, as a means of explaining recession and, uh, and resolving it through increased government intervention in systematic monetary and fiscal policy. We get uh, John, May uh, sorry, John Kenneth Galbraith coming along and in the footsteps of other great institutional economists like uh, J.R. Commons and earlier still Thorstein Veblen, showing how institutional change needs to be a central part of economic analysis, how it re responds to technological change, how uh, the development of corporate power can be abused and misused, uh, how there becomes a division of interest within the capitalist class between those who actually own the capital and those who manage it, the so-called div divide between uh, owners and managers uh, within, within modern capitalism. These are all extraordinarily valuable contributions. You get modern Marxists coming along, like David Harvey, applying that notion of economic surplus to the study of urban development and the inequalities that are associated with urban development. The Georgists might well say, I told you so. Um, we always knew that urban development would create increased inequality of, of income and wealth. But uh, it's interesting that those ideas, though discredited in the economic profession, keep coming back into mainstream discussions precisely because the problem doesn't go away. So it, it may not be labelled Georgism, but it's the same concerns about land speculation, the accumulation of wealth through unearned incomes associated with monopoly uh, ownership and control of nature's wealth. So uh, it's hard to know what to make of this 200 years and more in the development of economic ideas. Frankly, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, economists have always claimed to be trying to, con to understand what's going on out there, developing appropriate concepts for understanding it, and also for changing it for the better. I remember the very conservative predecessor of John Maynard Keynes at Cambridge University, the man who held the chair before Keynes was appointed, a man named A.C. Pigou, who uh, quite conservative economic doctrines, but made a wonderful preface to one of his books, which talked about the, the growing inequalities in society and the need for economic insights so that we can redress these wrongs out of the darkness light, he says in, in conclusion. Well, I suspect we're still wandering around in the dark. And if you look at the challenges out there, the challenges in the real world that we need to confront, they have changed in character, but certainly have not reduced in intensity. To my mind, there's the, the, the big three to which I earlier alluded, is economic insecurity, social inequality, and ecological unsustainability. The, the economic insecurity takes many forms. It, it has a, a macroeconomic character in the whole vulnerability of the economic system to periodic economic crises. Uh, when I went to university in the 1960s in the UK and studied economics, I learned a Keynesian story, which basically said, now that we understand the economy pretty well as a macroeconomic system, we know it's got a tendency to periodic crises and unemployment, but we've got the tools to prevent it ever happening again. That was the dominant story. And then, of course, some years later, the global financial crash emerges, and most astute analysts of that see it as rooted in speculative tendencies associated with housing markets, and thus, of course, 
traceable back to the land question. In other words, the uncertainties arising in the, uh, the uh, American housing market associated with the issue of mortgages in high-risk lending processes, which lead to instability in the value of the assets, the financial assets, produced by combining those mortgages together into so-called collateralised debt obligations, which uh, the financial institutions then become increasingly nervous about holding. They don't know the value of each other's assets. The system starts to break down. Rescue operation prevents uh, uh, a, a, a horrible uh, crash comparable to the Great Depression, and certainly in Australia, Keynesian economic policies implemented by the Australian government did pretty well as a temporary band-aid, pumping money into the economy to keep the economic system pumping along. But it didn't do anything to redress the more fundamental sources of crises that had erupted in the, in the global crash. Uh, in other words, it was a band-aid band-aid that worked, it stemmed the bleeding, uh, but the underlying uh, problem remains the same. So all the talk about the need to restructure the global financial architecture uh, has really come to nothing much. Indeed, it was always a little preposterous uh, because uh, finance doesn't operate according to the principles of architecture. <laughs> architecture is about building uh, observable uh, structures. Finance is about processes of exchange in which questions of trust, and reliability, risk are, are, are ever present. The notion that you could somehow eradicate the risks through some restructuring of the global financial architecture seems, uh, frankly, rather um, itself speculative. <laughs> and then economic inequality, much in my mind, because uh, in the wake of Thomas Piketty's major contribution in the book, capital in the 21st century, we now know that uh, there is an underlying tendency in capitalism to the increased inequality of wealth. Only in exceptional circumstances does that process get reversed. The such exceptional circumstances did occur, for example, during the 1950s and 1960s when governments here in Australia, Britain, most of Europe, North America engaged in progressive redistribution. In other words, increasing uh, rates of income tax with uh, marginal rates of tax up into the 80s and 90s for the very highest incomes and the, with the using those funds to develop a welfare state that provided more of a sort of social safety net to address the problems of poverty and exclusion from the mainstream economy. A very successful process. But once again, you might say, certainly from a Georgist perspective, or for that matter from a Marxist perspective, that that didn't fundamentally change the nature of capitalism. It made sure there was buoyant demand for goods and services. It was therefore conducive to economic growth. It seemed to tick the social justice box, for a while at least, by moderating the underlying tendencies to uh, increased economic inequality. But now, with the neoliberal era, we've moved on in, into letting, letting it rip, and the economic inequalities are continuing to increase within most capitalist countries. Uh, and increasingly, of course, in the developing countries like China and India that have achieved spectacular economic growth, spectacular as anything in human history in, in the case of China, but have also produced increased inequality. The growth has lifted the floor for the poorest of the poor, but it's enabled the richest of the rich to increase their overall share, even in communist China, where the official ideology, of course, is, is uh, still of that egalitarian character. The practice is quite different. Uh, but then... 
Don't get me started on the Chinese uh, state at the moment. Uh, in the context of what's going in uh, Hong Kong, I think we, we have to just accept that that's a rather volatile and unfinished story. I've tried to summarise some of the evidence and arguments around inequality uh, in my latest book on the political economy of inequality. It doesn't focus particularly on Australia. I've written about that in some earlier books, but uh, trying to take stock of what's happening around the world in this uh, process of globalisation, neoliberalism, financialization, ongoing urbanisation, shaping who gets what. And frankly, I think that the short version in one sentence is who gets what depends upon who owns what. And, and within those structures of ownership, it's ownership of land and natural resources that is a central part of the, of the action. And then there's ecological sustainability and, and the challenges arising from climate change and other environmental threats. Here too, I think we can see the ongoing relevance of Georgist ideas, if expanded, as I understand George wanted to, to embrace natural resources rather than simply land per se. And if we're talking about natural resources, mineral resources, the atmosphere itself as, as a common property, so to speak, in which we all share and deserve equal rights and access to in a healthy environment, then uh, I think we can interpret the challenge here from a, from a Georgist perspective. I think there's a, a lot of future for the increased tractability of, of Georgist ideas in contributing to debates around uh, the resolution of climate change if it's not already too late. I might, as I move to a conclusion point, to come back to the issue of the political process itself and our political institutions, because in addition to the challenges of economic insecurity, uh, which involve often increased layering up of debt, increased uh, insecurity of work, a growing incompatibility between housing unaffordability on the one hand and uh, volatile and uncertain wage incomes on the other hand. I'll pause at that moment because when I'm talking to student audiences, they immediately uh, re relate to that. How could you buy a house if you don't have a steady job with career prospects? I mean, just making the commitment itself, uh, even if you pass the, the criteria for getting loans, involves taking on an enormous uh, risk, which, uh, frankly, you wouldn't want to burden the next generation with if you've got any sense of social justice at all. Mark you, uh, the notion that somehow the, the, all, all, all of the oldies have stuffed all the, the, the opportunities for all of the younger folk is a bit misleading because among the oldies are some people who are doing very nicely indeed and are sitting on a valuable real estate, quite able and willing to help their offspring uh, acquire property, sometimes buying it for them, certainly lending them money that'll get them started. Uh, so what I'm saying is not a, a problem of intergenerational uh, stress, so much as the intragenerational stress, which become magnified over the generations themselves. Can our political system resolve these sorts of issues? I mean, in Australia, one has to be, I think, rightly sceptical about whether governments can tolerate the possibility of falling real estate values, for example, given that the appeal is 
always by the major political parties to uh, people who see themselves as having a stake in ongoing uh, appreciation of land and property values. Uh, they'll talk about the problem of housing affordability facing first-home buyers, but the only way actually to make housing more affordable is to reduce its price. Uh, of course, it would help if wages were rising too, uh, but uh, e even that wouldn't solve the problem because already we're in a situation where the average uh, urban house is going to take 10 years or more of, of, uh, of wages to, uh, to be become affordable. It's not surprising that people have become very sceptical about the political system's capacity to solve economic and social problems. I, I think George had in mind the, the notion that if you just develop the evidence and the argument, then people of good intent and, and good thought will act on it, uh, including by introducing appropriate policies. His, his, his mechanism and weapon for social change was the force of his argument, and perhaps also, to some extent, the, the strength of his character, though those warm, witty and wise characteristics for which he became so renowned. Uh, if you were here with us today, I think he would, like all of the rest of us, have to grapple with the uh, the profound problem of the modern state. What is it? It's not just a carrier of vested interest, it's become, in a sense, an obstacle to progress itself. And not surprisingly, some people have turned to uh, erratic uh, public figures such as President Trump uh, in the hope that somehow he can drain the swamp, uh, change, change the array of political possibilities. Whether for better or worse, we don't know, but let's do something different. That there's seems to be a, a sentiment of, uh, of that kind abroad. Um, and of course, uh, we know the potential for corruption of, of the political system. Um, I brought along a, a, a bag with me today. It's not actually an Audi bag, <laughs> um, but uh, if anyone's got any bunches of used notes that they want me to deliver to Sussex Street in Sydney, I, I, I'll be passing that way uh, tomorrow afternoon after I go back to Sydney. Uh, so I'll leave this uh, over by the <laughs> piano. Um, <laughs> Just in case anyone wants to deposit uh, some spare readies. <laughs> Hundred thousand dollars given by property developers to the Labour Party. Um, flagrant corruption, and it's not surprising it's all over the news uh, over the last week. But when you think about it, it's pretty small change. Pretty small change. Indeed, uh, over many years I've been surprised how little you have to bribe people in order to get them to behave in unprincipled ways. A few thousand dollars here and there. If you're talking about the corruption of the political system, it's much more fundamental than that. I mean, this, this is the tip of a big iceberg. Um, a little further down the iceberg is Malcolm Turnbull putting in two million dollars of his own money uh, a week before the uh, the last general election, uh, early before this recent one. Well, he's got the right to do that. There's nothing illegal about it. But it just goes to show how you know being rich, uh, whatever the source of that funds, can help to uh, bias the, po the political outcomes. And even more strikingly, of course, uh, Clive Palmer spending something in the range of 60 to 80 million dollars trying to prevent a Labour government being elected at the last election. That was clearly the message. I mean, he was totally unsuccessful in getting any of his own candidates up, but it was, uh, I think, a, a significant contributor to the Kill Bill uh, process. And uh, many of the advertisements more or less said that. Kill Bill. 
Uh, you don't want this guy running the show. Well, certainly Clive Palmer didn't want him running the show because uh, in their own inept way, the Labour Party were uh, moving to redress some of these inequities, talking about changing negative gearing as a tax rort, uh, a capital gains tax uh, discount on, on, on the skids too. Uh, so, and, and the future of mining, well, Labor made a complete mess of that in the election in identifying what their actual position was, but uh, I think Clive Palmer would have rightly uh, worked out that uh, Kill Bill was, was a, a, a good strategy from the viewpoint of his narrow self-interest. Uh, it's the more certain outcome now. Climate change is back on the back burner. Terrible uh, metaphor. Um, and uh, mining's ripping ahead. Adani, here we come. Thank you very much. Who gives a bugger? Uh, so it's not surprising that, you know, there's a certain disquiet around the use of information knowledge to produce enlightened public policy. I'm hoping some of you have got the answers to this. Let's have some discussion. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Stilwell. I wish that I had been in at least one of your lectures. I went to the wrong university. Um, so Frank has generously offered to answer our questions, or perhaps he's taking answers. I'm not, I'm not quite, yeah, 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 like let's have a conversation. That's what I, oh, I've got heaps. I've also got the mic, so this is awkward. Um, I'll, I'll run. Um, what are your thoughts on a universal basic income? I like the idea of a universal basic income for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Henry George, I think, toyed with it. Uh, it's, he, he raised on a number of occasions during his talks in Australia the possibility that a single tax on land might generate revenues that could be directly redistributed to the people. I don't think it was his preferred option, but he, he talked about it uh, as one of the possibilities. And if you're talking about a, 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 a process that eliminates poverty, tick. If you're talking about a process that frees people from what uh, some people would call wage slavery, tick. Uh, but if you're talking about a... a and it, it would help to provide a floor to inequality in the distribution of income, but it doesn't actually address the inequalities associated with land and natural resources. It's a, it, in other words, it's a redistributive mechanism, first and foremost, rather than a structural change in how wealth is generated and, and captured. Uh, but having said all of that, I think it's, it's a policy that's been talked around for a long time. It hasn't been acted on in any significant way to date, but it just seems to be that its time is coming. I'm supervising a PhD student at Sydney University whose topic is exactly this, the potential applicability of a universal basic income system in Australia. And he's doing all the numbers, yes, the modelling, uh, about whether it would be affordable. And uh, he, he says on a modest scale, it could be affordable. And he's got uh, some interesting calculations that he'll be publishing soon, done in conjunction with the statistical team at, at NatSem in Canada. Canberra, who are pretty good at this kind of economic modelling. And so, uh, but ultimately, I think it's, the reason it breaks through is that it's because it, um, it opens up further possibilities. If people are entitled to receive income as of right, this involves an expansion of our civil rights, uh, I think. In other words, the right 
not just to uh, be free of racial, ethnic, religious discrimination, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the right to actually have freedom of the sort that I think Henry George envisaged that we would have the freedoms that come with being in a more equitable society, the greater freedoms of, uh, and equality of opportunity. So I think all of that is well worth considering. And in summary, it's a radical reform, something that isn't just tinkering with the system, uh, because it's not only redistributive, it changes citizens' rights in ways that I think are conducive to equality and freedom. So that, that's my take on it, but I'll be very happy to hear other, other people's views. I think we should do that fun thing where you say who you are. Uh, hi, I, my name is Monica Sada. I'm an, a data scientist at Monash University. I really loved your presentation and your, your talk. It was very, very inspiring. Um, I recently went back to study economics after sort of a different career and you know, many people, you're, you're bright-eyed and maybe quite idealistic and thought, you know, this will help me understand how you can maybe optimise you know, some different values in society and then it was kind of shattered to see that we're really just optimising. You're taught just optimise one metric, you know, it's just GDP, you know, Gini coefficient is irrelevant. You know, second year you get there, and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm interested in intergenerational mobility, and you start to look at you know Hickman equations, and we're instrumenting away um, class factors, and, and it, it, there's there's that assumption that you know all of the constructs don't have any normative assumptions embedded in them, and if you try to raise the question, it's kind of you sort of shut down, and um, yeah, I just wanted like, have you seen that that that's been a, a, sh a recent shift that it's it's just become so orthodox? And homogenous, and for the new students coming up, and you know, I, I meet people who are, you know, are frustrated or have started their studies. Like, how how can they go about shifting that needle? Because we see so much in, in the media, you know, economic inequality is so hot right now. You know, all the, all the movies. But um, even Thomas Piketty has a doco, right? It has a really good poster. And the Fresh Prince is even in the poster. It's, it's crazy. But yeah, what what do we do? Uh, That's you, a big question. You, you develop an alternative, uh, which is, of course, what Henry George tried to do in his own time, to challenge the prevailing orthodoxy, develop alternative uh, and more effective alternatives. Uh, uh, the, the root problem, I think, in economics is twofold. One is that it separates its, itself off from the other social sciences, or what you might broad, broad, more broadly call social inquiry. Um, if you go back to the era of classical political economy, or the era of Smith, Ricardo, Marx, Mill, uh, George, th th there was no clear separation between the economic inquiry and the analysis of social issues, ethical issues, historical issues, political questions. This was all the stuff of political economy. But then uh, around the end of the 19th century, economics becomes separated from the study of politics, of, becomes separated from sociology and, and, uh, and moral philosophy somehow disappears into the ether. Uh, this, I think, has been largely unhelpful. Obviously, for the organisation of universities and, and the organisation of knowledge acquisition, it's sometimes useful to compartmentalise, to get started. But uh, when uh, God created the universe, she didn't divide it up into the economy, uh, the polity, uh, the society, the, 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 it, all these aspects of life are interdependent and so a good holistic understanding requires putting the pieces back together again. Hence I think political economy is more interdisciplinary in character than the narrow economics that defines itself in terms of a certain set of analytical techniques. And therein, of course, lies the second problem, the attempt to be scientific in emulating uh, the physical sciences, physics in particular. Uh, one uh, writer about this has described it as uh, physics envy. 
um, with a slightly little nuanced uh, phrase there. <laughs> Physics envy uh, as a problem within economics, that they want to have the status uh, 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 that's accorded to uh, people in the physical sciences who made major breakthroughs in understanding uh, the, uh, the, the physical world. Uh, I think it's, a, it's always important to be as coolly analytical as one can be. Uh, I don't think I've exhibited that in my remarks tonight, but I certainly do in my own writing. I try to look at alternative points of view, the evidence fairly coolly way up uh, where the balance lies. Uh, but that's, not, that's different from being scientific in that narrow sense. It, uh, the over mathematization the the abstraction from reality that 's necessary in order to construct theoretical models has on the whole been rather unenlightening uh, so getting getting down and dirty, getting some dirt under your fingernails by actually looking at what 's going on out there rather than remaining in a, a rarefied world of theoretical abstraction I, in fact, I remember some years ago this is a little bit of a rant here um, some years ago hearing a public lecture being given by a winner of the Nobel Prize for economic science actually there 's no such thing there 's a prize given annually by the, the Bank of Sweden in honor of Alfred Nobel but it 's not a proper Nobel science, uh, a Nobel Prize like the Peace Prize or for literature, for example. Uh, but the, the winner of the so-called Nobel Prize for economics one year was a man named Gerard de Brewer, uh, an economic theorist who came to Sydney one time. I went along to his public lecture and he said as a preamble to his talk, I don't want you to be confused about what I'm about to say. I'm going to be talking about economic theory. Please don't compare this with anything to do with economic reality. And when I finish, don't ask me questions about how my theory relates to reality. This is a purely theoretical exercise. And I thought, Jesus, what's the point? What's the point? I, I think I now know what the point is. You're constructing an ideology and, and doing so rather refreshingly, frankly, saying, I want to develop an ideology of an ideal world. Uh, don't confuse that with reality. And that tendency within economics seems to me to be uh, so inward looking as to render it, uh, if not useless, possibly even worse than useless, because it, it distorts our perception of reality by, where, where, when economics is uh, dominated by these unrealistic uh, thought experiments. It feels like you need to reduce something and put it into existing models as a metric in order to be able to show that it's valid or robust, but sometimes you don't necessarily want to reduce to that extent. And I yes. 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 Thank you. Well, that sounds. Oh. That sounds like a discussion for the bar downstairs later. Um, yeah, let's let's do it. I, <laughs> Kate caught my eye. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm Kate Shaw from uh, an urban geographer from the University of Melbourne. And, uh, and Frank, I have long admired your work from afar, so thank you very much. It's been a really very interesting talk. Um, so my question, and it is a question, <coughs> is isn't part of the problem complacency within... Um, <coughs> we can talk about the working class, but let's just call it the populace. I mean, as you rightly point out, um, um, <clears throat> poverty levels in China and in India and indeed most of the world are rising. I mean, <coughs> sorry, um, poverty levels are decreasing. Mm. The wealth of most people in the world is rising, um, with the obvious um, um, notable exceptions that the OECD tends to ignore. Um, mm. That's not a problem, I mean, that is not a um, <coughs> 
an issue that affects the increasing inequality. But what do you say to people who, in response to the critique that inequality is increasing, uh, the, the critique being, but the base level is increasing such that an increasing level of inequality is not that much of an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. There are fewer people in abject policy uh, and poverty now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why does inequality matter? Uh, yeah, good, very nice question. Um, there was a famous American vaudeville star who once said, uh, I've been poor and I've been rich, and believe you me, rich is better. Uh, I agree um, that getting out of poverty reliably reduces people's misery. Uh, but the evidence that further increases in material prosperity and the accumulation of prodigious wealth is not convincing in terms of its contribution to hu human well-being. Indeed, there's a growing volume of evidence to, which suggests that, A, the redress of poverty in the longer term and, and maintaining uh, uh, people out of poverty depends upon lowering the ceiling as well as raising the floor. In other words, that uh, the successful and sustainable assault on poverty will require uh, reduced inequality. In other words, it's not just helping people at the bottom, it's also uh, looking at the processes by which wealth is accumulated causing growing inequality, which in turn feeds back into the reproduction of poverty. Uh, Oxfam has certainly taken that line. They're, they're, they're renowned for decades as one of the international NGOs concerned with the reduction of world poverty. But as you may have seen in the recent publications over the last decade, they've switched their focus from simple poverty alleviation to a more general assault on inequality. And I think they're on sound grounds. And the reason for that uh, 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 is primarily because of the growing volume of evidence generated by social scientists about the statistical and causal connections between inequality and a vast array of social problems. I'm thinking particularly of a book written uh, just over a decade ago by some British epidemiologists, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, who uh, took a, a data from an array of countries according to a, an array of social problems. So they looked at rich countries and poor countries, and they looked at social problems such as physical ill health, um, mental ill health, uh, low rates of educational attainment, high rates of crime, violence, prison incarceration, and they found that there's a broad correlation between those social problems and the level of inequality. Now, one shouldn't be surprised that, that poverty causes ill health, but Wilkinson and Pickett's evidence suggests that more than that, inequality, the, or the countries in which inequality is greatest, tend to be those with the poorest health, other things being equal. And it's a complex story. None of these correlations are perfect or, or absolutely conclusive. Uh, but in, in their more recent book, Wilkinson and Pickett try to tease out a little bit more some of the causal connections, why inequality has such pernicious effects on social problems. Uh, and they look at issues that to do with the bonds of social solidarity and of trust. In other words, although the thoughts only just occurred to me, they go back to Adam Smith, but not to Smith's Wealth of Nations, which is all about economic incentives and the drivers for growth, but to Smith's earlier book, uh, which was about the social bonds that make societies work. If there's too much inequality, those social bonds become fractured. People sometimes talk people such heresies uh, as uh, trying to stir up class war. 
Well, as Warren Buffett famously said, there's a class war going on, all right, and our side's winning. Uh, yes, there are inequalities. They're structured around class, they're structured around gender, they're structured around ethnicity, and these are sources of social division uh, and, and conflict. One should hardly be surprised in societies where you get that breakdown of, of common interests that you find this proliferation of of social disorders. Uh, and also, and here's the real punchline, you find generally lower levels of happiness. Now, you shouldn't be surprised that societies with a higher uh, instance of social disorders, the people tend to be a little unhappy. I mean, life may be insecure. You can't walk down the street without getting mugged, or you, you can't get a good education because, you know, the, the system's been privatised and you can't afford the best of the available options on the menu. Blah, 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 blah. In other words, it's not surprising, really, that in societies where you get this uh, high instance of inequality, quality, you get these um, uh, less happy people. Yeah, politics of envy, I'm all for it. Uh, but, uh, no, 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 jo joking aside, this is not the politics of envy. It's a very difficult argument, I think, for us to deal with on the left. And I've not found a very good response yet. Well, this is mine. Well, I, I, I don't, don't think I can add much to what I've just said. The problem is the higher levels of social malaise and the reduced levels of social mobility, even though incomes on average are rising in most of the world. Not all the world, Africa. South, south of the Sahara is missing out anyway. Uh, and interestingly enough, Africans in general seem to be quite happy people. But uh, uh, <laughs> according to the statistics, but may, maybe, maybe there's a, uh, a cross-cultural <laughs> difference in the way in which we interpret happiness. I think this um, post-discussion discussion is going to be a beauty. Um, but I've got a thousand people wanting to ask questions. Who was, I had Andrew and these. I'm going to do short answers from here on in. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Andrew Gunter um, is a <laughs> Prosper member. Uh, Professor Stilwell, I noted that you, uh, you made reference uh, to uh, the fact that there are so many uh, Australians invested in high land values and increasing house prices as being one of the in increasing obstacles to, to change. I was thinking about the Rudd, the Rudd government introducing a $250,000 uh, insurance protection on bank balances during the uh, GFC phase. Mm -hmm. To what degree, and I know that the cost, it's, it's as if cost were not an obstacle, to what degree would an insurance policy against falling land value uh, undercut their concerns sufficient to get the traction you need to make major changes in the fiscal position of land. Hmm. That's an inter interesting thought. I haven't heard that uh, possibility being floated before. But I, I, it could. I, I mean, if we're talking about compensation of landowners for falling land values, um, I, I, I personally recoil from that because, I mean, <laughs> un unless you're going to average it out over the whole period uh, since they bought their land, I mean, let's, let's take the swings and the roundabouts into account here. I mean, if you've had 15 years of uh, steady appreciation in land values without doing anything in the way of human effort to justify that, that increase in your wealth, uh, so what if you have a couple of uh, lean years when the land values drop? I mean, God, you know, one's got to look at the whole lifetime of, of this process, not, not just compensate, compensate people for downturns if, if you don't take the uh, fruits of the upturns. But if, but if they remortgaged it for 90% last year, then they're, uh, they're in debt. 
know, the falling land value, yeah. you put them underwater. Yeah. Sure. I, th I think this recent progress report, though I haven't read it carefully yet, can address some of these problems. The question of the, the time period over which you take into account the wealth impacts of changing land values and changing forms of taxation, such as a shift from stamp duty to land tax. There may be a solution that can be engineered, so uh, perhaps this latest uh, report for progress signals some clues here. But I, I, I'm frankly a bit floundering myself. Hi, um, I'm Nick Kinshetti. I teach about blockchain at the Blockchain Centre and new systems training. Um, don't mean to hijack it, I've actually got two questions an easier one and a tough one. Easy one is if global financial architecture is an inappropriate metaphor, what's a better metaphor? The hard one is, if 130 odd years of campaigning hasn't changed government's minds about this and we can assume we're not going to change the mind of government about, around this, how can projects, uh, local or grassroots projects, actually implement something towards Georgia's economic policies for ourselves? Have you considered this, contemplated it, and developed any theories to that, to that end? On the first easy question, <laughs> I don't know that it is that easy, but uh, uh, if it's not about constructing a new global financial architecture, it's probably just about muddling through. <laughs> muddling through. Um, and putting some shock absorbers into the system so that it's, there are certain limits uh, which trigger um, stabilising mechanisms. I'm starting to sound like a, an architect again. Um, on the, the second bigger question, I don't know the answer, um, uh, but all, all I do know is from observing processes of social change, they tend to be more successful when there's a powerful critique, and I think the Georgists have got that, uh, where there's a powerful vision of the desired alternative, I'm not sure that the Georges vision has been all that well updated, but uh, work can be done on that. Uh, there needs to be a strategy for getting from the unacceptable present to the desired future. Um, that, I think, has to be more than just banging the drum and, and uh, re-articulating the arguments even if they become more sophisticated and backed by good reports and evidence, I still think that notion that knowledge and, and its broader dissemination and stronger advocacy is not enough. And then fourthly, there's the need for organisation. There are, of course, Georgist organisations, uh, perhaps a little more unity across them might be helpful, but I'm still not sure that what is regarded by much of the rest of the populace as a rather irrelevant religious sect uh, cuts it as, 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 a, as an effective organisation. I, I, I don't mean to, to be rude about that, but uh, I'm talking about th that as, as a popular perception uh, about people who are interested at all, and most people just don't know. Uh, so so I, I, I can't prescribe, but it seems to me those are the four sets of questions. Do we need to refine the critique? Do we need to update the, the vision? Do we need to diversify the strategy? And do we need some reorganisation of, of, of the troops? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your interesting talk. I have two comments I'd like to make um, with regard to the financial system and its buffers. The quantitative easing uh, was the thing that sort of saved the system by providing cash liquidity to the markets. The, the second one was that the um, Kevin Rudd's um, guaranteeing of um, 
people's accounts in banks was a stealth approach to refinancing the banks in Australia. Because at that time, the banks in Australia had very little cash into the uh, vaults as opposed to the huge mortgages they were holding. Uh, however, the question that I'm putting is regards to economic philosophy and all the great thinkers you mentioned. One thing that never came through your talk was simply the DNA of us being humans. Greed is what drives the system. Since the time of hunters and gatherers, we managed to acquire land and it was always wars fought over land because land is value for agriculture, for everything else, the basis of land, water, minerals and so on. So I think in terms of the overall economic philosophy, um, uh, we have to think uh, with, about who we are, what we are, what our DNA is, and what are those needs that drive us into an economic system. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, these are profound observations. I, I value your observations about the elements that uh, provided at least some temporary rescue from the global financial crash, but those reflections on the, the broader character of human nature are, I think, uh, are, are more deeply challenging. Um, greed. Yes, I, I, I take that as uh, an eternal feature of human nature, but it's not the only feature of human nature that's relevant to economic activity. Uh, we are all social beings. Uh, we uh, uh, flourish in social conditions. Uh, we are more prosperous and I think happier when we're engaged in cooperative activities. Uh, and I think though it's not inconceivable to think that those aspects of human nature, if one can use that concept, are the ones that a good society would wish to promote, not necessarily to eradicate greed and self-interest. As I said earlier, it's always trying. Uh, it's always present, uh, but uh, the, the Paul Keating quote, um, but there are these other elements that would create the society that Wilkins and Pickett are talking about, uh, more akin to, say, the Nordic states. And I, I often think that Australia is on the, the cusp between the, so the United States model on the one end, where, as Piketty and others have demonstrated, inequalities of wealth and income have relentlessly increased in the, in the last uh, few decades. I mean, it's become an enormously unequal society with the top percent cap top 1% capturing the bulk of, of the increased income and wealth generated in that society. At the other extreme, the, the Nordic states, which have always been much more egalitarian, long traditions of more social democratic politics, stronger labour movements, uh, which have resulted in a much narrower differentials between the rich and poor, and in general, according to surveys, more coherent, cohesive, uh, contented societies. Uh, which way is Australia to go? I just make a quick comment on so the social aspect. I was just thinking with the social input hundreds of hours into their creative comments in their social media often with no hope of remuneration and at the expense of their paid employment. And they're just getting creative comments and identity and social connection out of that. So it doesn't, doesn't that question, the fact that you're, the greed is the only thing that motivates you, if you're getting nothing in return and you're putting of your time and labor and opportunity and reputation into something that's only about connection, doesn't that tell you something that people have, and the fact that these companies have grown so far, yeah. that connection is just as important as, as Acquiring sure. I used to tell my students, don't use Wikipedia as a source for essays. <laughs> but I, 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 I've completely changed my tune on that. I think that this is a community resource produced by people, freely contributing, cooperating to get a better database on everything under the sun. 
I, and that, it's a wonderful example of more generally what, what you're talking about. And, uh, and so be it. I think there's a, the way forward here with using those network technologies, which could provide plentiful opportunities for productive social advance. Now, whether that's going to satisfy our full array of human needs, I don't know. But we all have, uh, going back to Maslow's pyramid of needs, we've all got basic needs for food, clothing, shelter. Uh, we've got social needs uh, for friendship, networks, communication, and we've got higher level needs for self actualization, which you might get out of spirituality, you might get out of relationship with nature, you might just get it out of a very enjoyable bushwalk. Uh, back to nature. Uh, th th those are the, perhaps the, the ultimately more fulfilling aspects in that pyramid of need. So, so greed's in the story, but so too is cooperation, and so too uh, are other aspects of, of, of human fulfilment. And if, if we can't build that all into our, our economic and social system, we'll be the poorer for it. Just for those who couldn't hear the comment that was made, um, Instagram was put up as an example of how humanity is not egotistical. Again, it's a, a, a fruitful discussion for over um, the bar. This is going to be our last question, folks. Um, Great, Tony. Professor, as a kid, I can remember watching some black and white movies and the great cities of the world were London, Paris, France, London, Paris, uh, somewhere else, else and uh, New Rome and New York. In recent years, Melbourne and Sydney have been seen some of those wonderful cities because of the prices that people are prepared to pay. I thought that we had higher prices because in Australia we don't have non-recourse loans, which was America's problem. Too simplistic. Um, I also thought, well, my father applied for a loan, the bank manager didn't even talk to my mother. Then a couple would go along to the bank and the bank would say, well, we can lend these people twice as much money because we'll take both incomes into account. Mm. Those theories were completely flawed early on when Emily mentioned that uh, Henry George came out, to America, came out to Australia 140, 170 years ago and identified Australia as being one of the dearest countries in the world. What is, what is it? other than greed, because the whole world's greedy, what else is it about Australia that for 150 years we've had the most ridiculous bloody prices in the world? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Uh, Australia is a huge continent with a relatively small population, but they're uh, disproportionately clustered into a few urban areas. And uh, I think in, in brief, that, that's the answer to your question, is that we've not balanced our regional development in ways that are uh, economically efficient, socially equitable and ecologically sustainable. We, we've developed this metropolitan primacy, not in the nation as a whole, but within each of the states, which is simply a, a colonial hangover. These were the points of initial settlement that, like Topsy, have just grown and grown and grown. And uh, governments have fueled the process in many respects, but governments have not been very vigorous in promoting more balanced patterns of regional development. The Whitlam government had a go in the early, 20, uh, in the early 70s. Uh, with its Department of Urban and Regional Development, or DERD, as it was fondly known. Um, uh, but it was a very short-lived experiment. I think if had the Whitlam government stayed in power, and more importantly, had the program had cross-party support, uh, it could have come to fruition with new town developments, Albury-Wodonga was one, the Bathurst Orange area in New South Wales another, Murray Bridge in South Australia was floated, but that uh, not, nothing happened, not, not a sod was turned, and uh, the, 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 the program was completely abandoned once the Whitlam government was uh, ejected and the Fraser government installed, and no, six, no government since then has 
gone that direction. There were periodic conferences on uh, the future of Australian cities. Emily recently attended one in Darwin. These, these issues get talked about, but once again, the lack of political action is pretty blatantly obvious. And some would say, well, cross-party cooperation? What, 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 what? Are you dreaming? Cross-party cooperation on anything? But without that, you, you simply can't get uh, a policy like this up and running. Because it takes take 20 years to develop significant changes in our patterns of urban and regional development. But without that, I think we're, we're on this uh, treadmill to nowhere. So that's why throughout my whole academic career, I've tried to blend the study of political economy with the study of cities and regions, because although, thank you for the geographer at the back, uh, geography matters, of course. So it does, it's, it's not the only decisive thing, but it, it has to be incorporated into any planning process for a sustainable future. And I think if new cities were developed around modern, sustainable technologies, uh, renewable energy sources, that would be an added bonus, a contribution to, uh, to the major ecological challenge of the time. Thank you very much. <laughs>